welcome to the second rendition of this introduction on fails, falls, and fuck ups. Because if this show has done anything for me, it's proved that I can't do anything right at any time. And joining me to enjoy my screw ups one after the other is Dance Master Kurt Turnbull of QFX. Kurt, did I do it again? Did I say your name wrong again? No. I feel like I did. It's just Kirk. It is just Kirk. And I know that. And every time I say it, like. It's me, little used to say Kirk. <laughs> Kirk. Kirk. That, exactly. God damn it, Kirk. God damn it, Captain. We're a band, not an army. God damn it, Jim. I'm a doctor, not a scientist. <laughs> That's true. And you also have a, the very same cup that I have in the cabinet. But that's not the point. Today, I wanted to ask you about your failures. So tell me about your failures. Wow. Where do we start? So thinking about your career, think early on. What is a mistake you've made when you, early on that seemed like it almost would have been career ending or at least career damaging, and yet further along the way, it paid dividends in ways you didn't expect? There's been a, quite a few. Where I wouldn't say you would call them fuck ups, but uh, yeah, uh, you would call them fuck ups. But the 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 just things that you that you wish you'd done differently, or wish you'd done instead of what you did do. Um, like, in, you know, I, I think as an example, there was um, we were touring um, in uh, Northern Ireland, and uh, we were playing two two massive concerts um, with a a European act called Scooter. And um, Scooter were humongously big everywhere in Europe and everywhere that you went. I mean, they're world they're world famous now, but back then they were, you know, they were on a global platform. And um, we did a couple of shows with the with the band, and uh, we got on really well with them. And they asked us to tour Europe with them, and it was I would say it, it was the biggest fuck up saying no ever in in the history of the band why did you say no um because i was really busy in the studio at the time writing another album and and just bad judgment i i should have said yes done the tour and then come back to the album because the the exposure that we'd have got in europe would have been enough to put us on a global platform um so that was a major fuck up saying no um and he, i think i've had a lot of those throughout my career um certainly that one is a highlight um the other one was being asked to um work with trevor horn um who's a really famous producer here in, in the united in the united kingdom um he did uh, he was buggles you know video killed the radio star I've heard of that one. Yeah, yeah. He, he, I mean, he was number one in 17 countries or something. It kicked off MTV. Yeah, yeah, he kicked off MTV, exactly. But what the thing about Trevor Horn was after Buggles, he, he went on to produce artists like Seal and um, literally a handful of huge albums as a producer. And by the time he actually asked for me to work with him, which was in the early 2000s, I I, I kind of thought that what a great opportunity, but again I, I said no because I was busy writing an album, and and just sometimes you just you get these moments and you just say, "Fuck that, Jim, let's go with that," <laughs> and um, I wish I'd done that on the, on both those occasions. So they were they were I would say they were real fuck ups. Let me ask you this, um, because as as you know, I'm not only am I. Fame blind, I'm also um, illiterate. So, do you feel w when rating QFX, which you're huge in Europe, how do you see yourself globally? Um, I mean, we're definitely a global act now. We were never, we were never, uh, and during the nineties, to be a global act was something else. I mean, uh, literally, because it's not like it is now, where everything was digital. I mean, digital, digital changed the world completely when it came to musicians and music and video and stuff like that. I mean, back in the day when, when, you know, we started our first record company and we were having chart success in the UK and, and Europe and stuff to get, to get a deal onto say 
Germany or Italy or one of these other countries was was literally you had to sign to another label in that country or in that territory. Whereas now, you know, as soon as I release a record, as soon as I finish a record, stick it up digitally. I'm on every single platform in the world, everywhere that these platforms are, which is a huge difference. And I think I think going back to the scooter incident, the fuck up, it was, um, you know, I would have probably circumvented years and years of being stuck, well known in just one territory or, or some territories in Europe, rather than I would have been globally well known in all of Europe. and. And then probably also would have took us into the United States a bit as well, which has always been a goal for, for the arc. So not going with Scooter ended up being a, a moment that looking back, you feel stunted your progress. Yeah. Do you feel you're still dealing with the ramifications of making those choices, not working with Trevor, not working with Scooter? Are you still sort of coming back from behind that? Or have you made up that ground? Um, I would say I am now starting to make up that ground, but this is, you know, 20 years later. Um, I think it definitely held me back. It definitely held the band back and, and it made a huge difference to where we would be placed now. Whether we would still be going now because of it, I don't know. I mean, it's one of these, it's one of these old questions where, you, you know, if you take one path down life, um, would you still end up at the same place you are at this moment, or would your path be completely different and you fall off a fucking cliff? Right. <laughs> it's, it is kind of it's kind of the the situation with with that one, but I, I certainly think I certainly think it definitely took me years and years and years to get over not doing that, and and it's also learned me a very valuable lesson, which is if you get an opportunity. Grab it with both hands and make it work. Somehow make it work. Yeah, I agree with that. You've got to take your shots when they present themselves because you never know when fortune smiles. I don't believe in, I don't really believe in luck per se as some kind of force, but luck is real. Things will happen and you'll have an opportunity. And if you don't take it, it just may never come back around. Certainly not the way it's being presented to you at that time and you don't know what the results are. So. Sometimes you just have to go like, well, okay, this wasn't what I was looking for, but boom. Yeah. Any other particular things that you look back on and go like, oh, if I could have only talked to myself and maybe slapped me a few times, I know I could have helped me a little bit. Yeah, I think I think there's definitely lots of moments where you're you're looking back and and you're thinking about your past. I mean, certainly how you were as a human being or how you were as a an artist, um, things that you wrote and produced that you should have just went. No, it's a bad idea. Keep to the formula. Make that tune again. Make it like that. I think that 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 is in hindsight. You know, I think we're like eight albums, eight or nine albums now down the road, and we could have. I mean, to be honest, it's not that productive considering we've got a career of thirty years this year. Um, but then I, I'm a great great believer in taking huge sabbaticals and <laughs> just saying, fuck it, I'm not going to write anything or, or I, I don't want to do that. Um, so I think, yeah, I think I, I would have loved to be more creative. I would have loved to have known made certain albums as creative choices, um, you know, but I think, I think one thing that an artist can do is they can have a very successful first album, but then when they come to do the next album. The sophomore slump. Well, it's not so much that, that it's that they tend to go, hey, I made this hugely successful album, I'll just copy it. Or they go the exact opposite way and go, I want to do something completely off the wall, something completely different, and then it turns out to be the biggest pile of shit ever, or it just turns out to be crap. And 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 you go to yourself, what the fuck was my head thinking then? I should have just stuck to the formula, made another album like that first album, and hopefully it would have been as good and it just sold as well. I could be interpreting here, but I think what you're saying is that QFX shouldn't have followed up their first album with their death metal album. <laughs> well, actually... It wasn't that. It was the second album was kind of like the first album, but the third album was completely off the wall. And the fourth album 
was completely in the opposite direction and try to be too commercial. And I think sometimes when you think about music too much, you end up going down a path that you should never go down. You should never go down that path. As somebody as creatively creative as you are, creatively speaking, have you found yourself get caught on a song or an idea that turned out to not be that great when you're looking back on it, but you just were like a, a dog with a piece of meat and just you <laughs> couldn't let it go? Very much so. I mean, I think I'm very much one person that would go with an idea and 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 because it's up here, a lot of the time my creative eyes are up, the ideas are up here, and I see them in my head, and I'm like, this is how it's going to sound, and trying to get that sound onto onto the notes and onto the, especially when you don't know technically what you're actually thinking. You just know that that would sound great if I did that. But technically, I haven't got the brain to figure out what that actually is. So, <laughs> yeah. The music just works through me. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just trying to get it out into the universe. Well, that's exactly how it works for me anyway. <laughs> I just connect to the universe and it just gives me these ideas. And, and sometimes I'm able to bumble my way through to make it sound like that idea. And I, and I think I've probably got better at bumbling my way through things over the years as I have now, as I had then. So I should say, um, yes, I, I would say that you do get ideas, you do get stuck with them. And I do tend to just keep going until I fucking smack it through and knock it out. And, and that's it. It's done. How long did it take you to learn when to just call something finished? Are you the sort of like... Because you've got a tenacity to you, absolutely. But have you learned how to put that to the side sometimes where it's like, okay, I've been working on this thing and there might be some disconnect from the idea in my head, but at some point life must move on. Or do you just still just, we're just going for it? I, 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 have, I have done that, but usually I, I'll, I'll say, right, after a day or two days or just being non-productive, I'll just jump onto something else and do something else and then go back to that idea um, two, three weeks later with a fresh, fresh mind on it. A lot of the time, I was saying this to my wife yesterday, actually, that you know you can be creating something, and it's amazing how, you, how, you, how you've got so involved in the creative pro process of that piece of music that you don't notice that fucking the singing was off key for the whole song. <laughs> The micro focus, you're so you're yeah. so on the details that you just can't see the global thing. I mean, it's only ever happened to me once and it was this week. And and, and I said, I can't understand that. It's the first time in my career this has happened. Yeah, I've missed notes, but I've never missed a whole verse of a song being off key until until I go away, come back 10 minutes later and I go, what the hell is that? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it does. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does happen, it's a real pain. So kids, take from that this lesson. Even the professionals can get so caught up and so wrapped up that the big obvious things sometimes cannot be seen. And that's just because of the micro focus. We all do it. I've never had it so bad in my career. And, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm just, I think it must have been the state of mind because I was trying so hard and so focused that I completely missed, missed the key of it and just couldn't believe it. What was the most intense experience you've had, either being a live show, a production schedule, or just some kind of work obligation that just was something that was near insanity? I remember, I remember early on in my career, I was writing, a, writing an album for Sony Music and um, the computer crashed. <laughs> and I lost it all. Hard drive dead, not the computer turned off. The hard drive blew up. Yeah, yeah. The whole, I lost everything. The whole albums. It's like seven months worth of work, just gone. How long were you in a fetal position? Oh, I don't know, but the, the computer got, <laughs> got well and truly hammered. <laughs> there was no way it was coming back to life. I moved, that was, that was, that was my experience with, PC and and after that I moved to Macintosh and constant backing up too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it's funny because in the olden days, like I'm, I mean, talking in the not the past ten years, but before that, 
he would be backing up a song every 30 seconds as soon as he'd made a major tune. Save, <laughs> save, save. And it just felt like he, he were actually spending more time saving stuff than he were actually creating stuff. What happened to you? Save, save, save doesn't matter because the hard drive went. It's that redundancy. Back in the day when it was more analog, mm -hmm. did you have any um, instance where, hey, we really you know, busted our ass and, oh, the tape got chewed? Well, that was a huge part of my early career. And, and pretty much anybody that was in, into dance music, we played most of the stuff on backing track on a, on a digital audio tape live. So we would play so much live and so much off the tape. And the tapes, you used to go with a hairdryer. And he used to spend the first 25 minutes of the, bringing the dart machine up to temperature and trying to make sure that the tape didn't stick to the head. And, 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 and the, seriously, you, you, you could hear it sometimes during the show. Even if it was digital, you could hear it kind of go, <laughs> as, it, as, as the tape kind of stretched and elongated inside the machine. How long did a tape last you? Like. You've got your backing tracks, and if that goes... Well, we were making new backing tracks every week, but the, the thing was that, you know, the, the clubs that we were playing you would maybe be five, 600 capacity, quite small clubs, and then you would get there and there'd be 1,500 in, in a 500 club, and it would be raining off the ceilings. I mean, literally, it was rain. The sweat as you were as you were performing, and the sweat was just it was just it was it was it was so busy and so hot that it would rain inside. And cassettes love humidity; they really do. Well, the, the, you know the, the, these dark machines were so temperamental that, that you would be replacing them every six months with a new one because they were just goose. Is that the reason? Part of the reason the format itself never took off because it was so unreliable. Well, in the studio it was fantastic as as a as a recording medium inside a studio. They were amazing, but on the road they were they were a nightmare. You mentioned these five hundred uh, cedar club cedar. Nobody sitting there with three times the amount in. But did you have your technology fail you when you were on the big big stage? Um, because that would have been fun. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's definitely been an occasion where. I think it's human error more than... We can blame a band member. I'm perfectly fine blaming one of your band members. Well, sometimes band members can, can cause a fuck up with my music because I have a machine that, that you can trigger by your hand. So you can trigger, you can trigger, you can trigger the sounds we're using your hands. So like it, has a, it has a sensor, a beam sensor on it. You can break it, and the higher up or the lower down it goes, the frequency it filters and stuff. And I've had band members just thinking they're funny and coming across and go, oh, and this thing goes, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, fuck off. <laughs> Stop. Push them away. So you're here to dance, not to mess about. <laughs> oh, and the other times it's just been human. I mean, it's been just error. I've just ended up, you know, starting playing the same song twice by mistake. And and I, I, there, was, there, was t there was actually a couple of times where, I played a remix of the song that we've already done, but I didn't realize it was a remix because I put it on the wrong pad and started playing that one instead of playing one of the other ones. <laughs> and then it, you get halfway through and it suddenly dawns to you in the performance. That was the song we played 20 minutes ago. And you have to say, this is a remix. <laughs> this is a remix, folks. Love it. <laughs> Gotta be released soon. Yeah. Fun and games. As an award-winning music producer, performance artist, the dance master that you are. What was your least favorite part of your industry that you had to deal with and how problematic was it for you and how did you cope with it? Um, there's quite a few parts of the industry that you kind of wish you didn't have to deal with. Um, I would say certain promoting, promoters, um, certain um, music industry people um, and then just uh, very rarely I would say would, would it ever be somebody that came to see it would, it would always be somebody that was supposed to be in a professional position just not being professional how often did that happen um, 
Not very often. Maybe maybe once a year. You know, twice a year you would have to deal with somebody. I mean, one of the occasions I had to deal with the guy that the promoter that put on the whole event, walking out stage, out on stage, buck naked. <laughs> and I'm like, what? The fuck? Was there some kind of internal logic to him doing this, or I think he was just he was just crazy mad with with, with drink and something else, and just. Luckily, he wasn't there for very long. I mean, it wasn't during my show, but it was during <laughs> during the night. And, and I thought to myself, that was a bit unprofessional. Guess him being na- naked waving around could probably trigger your thing and s- launch off the wrong song at the wrong time. Most definitely not with this guy. <laughs> 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 if he got it to wave, I'd be impressed. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> Whatever do you mean? Um, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> has anyone's unprofessionalism ever cost you money, a job, um, a relationship? Not with them. I assume that their unprofessional would have cost the relationship with them, but with somebody else. Um, have you ever had to pay a heavy price for somebody's unprofessionalism? Yes. Bond members. Um, you know, doing shit in hotels that we shouldn't have done, um, cost 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 the band. You know, promoters wouldn't work with us after a certain event and said, "Well, I know for a fact that you know I, I, they'd been told not to do that, and they had done it." And I understand, you know, that's how it came down to it. So yeah, you, you, you do get that now and again where somebody's been unprofessional and and not thinking logically or. Okay, that's funny, but it's going to cost us work. It's going to cost me financially. Aside from the band, has there been an external somebody that you were dealing with that also cost you money? Yeah, there was. There was. There was an occasion where we, we were we were working with um, a certain record label, and they were supposed to be getting us live work, and um, they, they kind of said, "Well, nobody's really wanting you." We'd phone up and we'd say. Why aren't we gigging? You know, we were always gigging. Why aren't we gigging? Well, nobody, nobody's booking you. And then it dawned on us that they were promoting another artist rather than us. And 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 they said, right, okay, we're. We said, ah, oh, we've had enough. We're we're not doing that. You know, we're leaving. Within two days of leaving, we were like hundred shows or something booked. So it was definitely somebody fucking with their career. What's being implied here, I think is that this company was specifically having on, had you on to book you specifically so that they could book somebody else in your stead. Yeah. hundred percent. Oh, that is really, really dirty pool there. That is <laughs> underhanded. Yeah. Yeah. There was, there was one or two in, in the music industry that were like, that. I mean, we learned quickly. We, we lost ground for a couple of weeks, but, we came back fighting and dominated, you know, won awards and became the top act in the UK pretty much within three, four months. So, A tangential question I have from this line of thinking is, did you find that as your success grew, that there were people in your life that it cost you relationships with? Um, not down to... Um, success i think it was it was more down to um just not getting along with them because the work was getting in the way and because uh, you know i think i think people grow and change so i think even though you can be in one industry you can be in the music industry and you can be doing really well in the music industry that some people will you know look at that and go oh, why am i not successful and that person's successful so I think relationships do change, um, not just not just uh, you know people that you were you know like partners with, but just outside friends that you'd had for years, just kind of changing their attitude towards you and, and the way that you looked at you. Get a little jealous and a little resentful because you have a degree of success they may not. Yes, definitely, it definitely happens. Does it still happen? Yeah, I would say it does. I would I would say that 
some people do get intimidated with the fact that you've been successful or you're having success and um they do they don't like it i mean to be honest the, the people that are have around me now and the people that are class as friends now it's very rare and 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 to be honest i try and keep my friends you know quite close to me and they know me personally so it's it's okay anything weird or strange that you would like to relay just some whacked out story that even now looking back you're like that actually happened to me and i lived through that um yeah there, there was an occasion when i was um we were on tour and uh we were staying in this hotel and uh I got up to go to breakfast about, for some reason I was up early and it was unusual for me. It was like 7.30 in the morning and normally we book late checkouts so that we can sleep because we are normally on stage at 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Right. So, uh, you know. You got to bed at 5. Yeah, we get to bed at 5, so we usually don't get up early. So this occasion, for some reason, I decided to go down to breakfast early. And I was, as I was about to get in the lift in the hotel, the doors open, and there's my dancer standing bollock naked, covering his privates with his hands. And I'm like, what the fuck have you been up to? And he's like, don't ask, and don't tell anybody. And he just shot off down, down the hall. And I got in the left and I just, I was like, what the hell was that about? And anyway, so after that, him saying, don't tell anybody, that was the story of conversation <laughs> for the next two days was, what were you doing? Why were you naked at this time of the morning? And it turns out he would he, he'd slept walked in the middle of the night <laughs> naked. Went out of the hotel room, found himself on the second floor, woken by somebody pushing a trolley to clean a room, and realizing, shit, I'm all naked. <laughs> First thing he could see was the elevator, pressing the button on the elevator until it opened, gets in the elevator, and then the next thing he sees is me. <laughs> The funny thing there is he was woken up by the trolley cleaning the room. And this is where his powers of perception are called into question because usually on those trolleys are things like towels and yep. bed sheets. And he could have toged himself up. And at that way he could have just looked at you and been like, uh, I conquered like an emperor. <laughs> Here's a question for you. Did you have considering that, there were various female members of the band. Did the female members of your band take a lot of shit on the road? Did they get um, potentially harassed, abused, insulted, possibly attempted sexually assaulted? Did you have to, did they need, were, did, were they good at protecting themselves? Did you need to protect them? How was that like in the dance scene? Um, no, I mean, we always looked after, the, they were always looked after by us. I mean, it was obviously one singer and five guys in the band because it was myself and, and at the MC and then three dancers, we were all male. So the, the, they were always looked after very well. But I mean, singers on the road are a pain in the ass, full stop. There are always problems, full stop. Um, so, <laughs> but we always looked after them really well. And yes, they did get thoroughly, thoroughly ridiculed wherever we were touring, you know, like if we were, because you got to remember, we were a band where we were traveling in a, in a, uh, an MPV and, you know, seven of us or six of us in this MPV. So. Cause I'm not exactly sure what an MPV is and I'm sure people in America may not be. What are, is it just a bus or. Um, what do you call it? What do you call it in America? You call it a van, um, a minivan, you know, with minivan. Lots, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So. We were traveling one of those all the time and, and, and for hours and hours on end and the amount of practical jokes that went on in the van was hilarious. And the one that I used to play every week, every week without fail, was the four o'clock in the morning, 
driving back home. Ah, we're gonna die! <laughs> That's what I would scream. I would hit the brakes and scream. Ah, we're gonna die! <laughs> and they would all be sleeping, and then they'd be like, Whoo! And then came the one time where you almost died, and they didn't believe you. Well, it, it happened a few times. <laughs> There was the odd occasion where we actually, although I would usually warn them. Uh, I mean, there was one occasion where I was, uh, we were going on a night out and the singer was with us in the back of the car. And um, I, I, was in my, I was in my personal car, um, which, 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 which happened to be a, a carless Sane Salika GT4, which was a World Rally car. And uh, I decided that I was going to go around the corner sideways. <laughs> You're going to drift. I shouts to the girls in the back, hold on to your knickers, because we're going around sideways. So I whacked on the handbrake, slid the car perfectly around the corner. Then the four-wheel drive kicked in, flipped me the other way, and we landed up in the forest. <laughs> and so we, we get out of the car. The car it wasn't too bad a crash. It was just, just a little crash. We get out of the car, and the singer's standing there going, oh, my God. But what she didn't realise was she had a boob tube on it. It was down round her waist. So she's... Fully exposed to the forest. Fully exposed. But luckily, it happened right next to a cottage, a, a little farm cottage, and uh, the old lady in it came out and plied the girls with drink, phoned a taxi for them so they could go to the nightclub, and I had to deal with getting the car out of the forest. <laughs> You said dealing with singers is a pain in the ass. Is that like how is it? Was it an ego thing? Is it just because the singers are the center of attention? What makes a singer a pain in the ass? <laughs> no comment. I might incriminate myself. I finally found the line. <laughs> I take the fifth, your honor. <laughs> I finally found the line where he's going to be like, Okay, I agree to a lot. I didn't agree to that. <laughs> I take the fifth. But you know the thoughts out there. Yeah. So coming into the wrap up, what's a little thought, bit of advice, a little thing for some, it doesn't matter what, they're, what somebody's doing, that you'd give somebody in their life. What should they do? What shouldn't they do? What they should do is do everything to the best of their ability try and try and do whatever they're doing whatever it is try doing it their best always and knowing to themselves that they've they've done it their best um what they shouldn't do is um take it take people lightly you know always remember that you're if you're if you're in a career and you're trying to go up a ladder and get to the top you've always at some point got to come back down that ladder so Always be ready for it and always be nice to the people on the way up so that they're nice to you on the way back down. Treat everybody with respect, basically. Yeah. 100%. Awesome. So now, Kirk, plug yourself. Just shamelessly plug yourself. I don't know how to. <laughs> well, you're in a band called <laughs> QFX. Yeah. You might have a website. You might have songs somewhere. That's right. We do. Here I am teaching you how to plug yourself. <laughs> I'm Kirk Turnbull from QFX. You can find us on QFXmusic.com, Spotify, Instagram, and all the others. Um, you can also um, find us on YouTube with our own YouTube channel called QFX Video. Um, and we've got a new show coming on there soon called Through the Looking Glass, which is Featuring lots of dance artists, it's a 30 minute show. Um, it's got lots of entertainment on it, plus behind the scenes of making of the music. Um, and I don't know how more shameless that can be, but just listen to our music, enjoy our music, and we're always there to listen to. You.